Test, test, test. Howdy. Was it normal to receive the email from the free tier about saying that there was too many calls or something? Yeah, they give uh, they give an absurdly uh, low number of S three API calls. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, I, 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 I somebody else hit that over the weekend and I calculated. Um, I think for every ten thousand, it's uh, a tenth of a penny. So we'll be we'll be okay. I mean, I'm in the account. It says five cents. So. Oh, five cents. Wow, that's, that's higher <laughs> than that. Hey, Latonia, it's a long time to see. So I was trying to find my mouse. How have you been? Good, how are you? Three weeks to graduation. Oh boy. How are you feeling, Nathan? I'm feeling much better. Thank you. Thank you oh, for thank asking. You. Yeah, it's uh 
kids. I mean, they're just, they just bring everything that they've got home from daycare. It's just the big biological melting pot in our house. Give it a couple more minutes and we'll go ahead and kick off. All right. So, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, before, but before I jump into anything, I'm going to open the floor for any questions or comments or thoughts from from last week. Concerns. Has anybody been doing work on their capstone? Anybody have any uh, any roadblocks or problems they've run into that we could discuss as a group? I was working on my capstone with Max. I did my full database for all of my pantries in the database, um, and we added a direction page. But my direction um, is not working on it. Everything else is but the direction itself is not working. I made an appointment with you on Friday for two sessions to see if I could finally get that working, but my mm -hmm. platform is doing what it's supposed to do and everything else. I just need to finalize those things before I could actually deploy it. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be one of the things that we might have time to actually talk about today is... Uh... We're going to be looking at how uh, how we handle databases um, because, uh, well, one of the challenging parts of getting our deploy out the capstone is going to be what what do we do about the database? So, so yeah, but but if we do, if I don't answer uh, answer your questions today um, or tomorrow, um, I'll be the happy to meet with you on Friday. Anybody else? Anything is fair game. I'm, I'm not just a deploy person. Go ahead. Um, right now for my database, 
Um, I'm thinking of maybe adding images. So for like mm. what I'm trying to do. And I did some research. It's something to do with a blob type or whatever, but I don't really know uh, how to go about doing that, really. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, okay. So um, what you'll see most people do uh, if they want to add images to their database is they'll host the images somewhere and then store the URL to the image in the database. Mm. Um, now, I've worked at places where they've actually stored the binary for the image in the in the database. So uh, take the raw file content, so the raw PNG, the raw JPEG, or whatever, um, and store it into a uh, into a column. Uh, that's also an option. Um, databases aren't really that aren't that good at storing raw data inside of a column. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's definitely something you can do, uh, especially if your images are going to be pretty small. Like if you were to do like avatars or thumbnails or something like that. Yeah, it's um, going to be small. It's not going to be anything big, really. It's just like when the user clicks on a car and, mm -hmm. and um, it populates everything. Also, uh, maybe I might not even be able to implement it by the time we got to present everything. But mm -hmm. I, know, I just want to like have a picture in there so they can see and all that. Because currently it only has... The range, price, drivetrain, and I was like, "Huh, I should probably add a picture because you know, yeah. some are visionary learners." So, yeah, yeah, totally. I, I guess the right way would definitely be to uh, to to uh, store URLs to images in the database. Um, I'll write that down. I'll look into it more. Cool. Yeah, but I think Postgres has a binary column type. I might be wrong. I know it has a JSON binary column type, but I, I think there's a there's a binary column type. All right. So uh, I was out sick sick yesterday. Um, so we're gonna have to kind of change uh, change things up just a little bit. Um, really, the goal for this week is still uh, what we had said last week, which is. We need to get the capstones deployed, um, but um, our goal for today, uh, our goal for today, really is to get uh, is really to get the back end deployed, and the back end also includes the database. So we're going to work on the back end and the database primarily. Tomorrow um, is going to be a, a wrap up of um, some of the. Uh, some of the um, automation that we can do in order to make our deploys a lot quicker, um, including um, just some other uh, troubleshooting um, related uh, content that uh, that I want to share. Um, but then on Thursday, so we've got today and then tomorrow, um, we're going to primarily do, be doing capstone work. But then on Thursday, we're going to do what we did um, back in week six or seven. And on Thursday, we're going to do um, we're going to go around uh, around the the classroom, and um, we're going to make sure that everyone's capstone is deployed. Um, so everyone should be walking away on Thursday with the working capstone. Um, that's not to say that. Uh, that's not to say that um, that's any reason to not follow along in class. Like I need everybody to just to, to try to stay with me today and tomorrow because we're going to go pretty fast. Um, but I'm going to make sure that we all walk away on Thursday with the working capstone and nobody is uh, nobody is sweating bullets, um, worrying about what they're going to demo. Well, I, you'll probably still be sweating bullets about what you're going to demo, but I'll make sure at least the deployed part is uh, is taken care of. Uh, does that sound good to everybody? Is there any questions about that? Nobody should be feeling stressed or nervous. Um, or I, I promise we'll we'll all walk away uh, from this this week feeling feeling confident. Okay. Um, and then the other item is uh, office hours. Uh, I propose that we have office hours at 10 a.m. on uh, Saturday the fourth. So if you um, have more questions. Hopefully, we should have everyone's capstones deployed on Thursday. But if for some reason you have something more on top of what we weren't able to get to on Thursday, feel free to come uh, come for the office hours this weekend. Um, and I'll post that again in Slack. But uh, just tentatively for now, 
um, if you are interested in office hours, they will be at 10 uh, on Saturday. Okay, so let me share my screen. Let's jump back into it. All right, so where did we end last time? We were talking about these three pieces of, well, these three Amazon products, CloudFront, S3, and Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, just a quick refresher of S3. Rem remember that S3 is really just like a glorified Dropbox. You take files and you put it in there. Now we're using S3 as a means of storing our front end code. So we're going to take all the things that we want uh, to show up on our website and we're going to shove them into S3. Um, so far, we haven't, uh, we've uploaded the blog front end to S3, but we haven't actually uh, changed anything on the, on the blog front end. Let me show you how to do that today. Um, I'm going to show you how to redeploy your front end code uh, before we start talking about the back end code. But uh, for all intents and purposes, S3 is how we're going to host our front end. And it's just a, it's just a generic uh, storage place um, for us to, to serve files from. Okay, so we went through this already. Um, recall that we set up static website hosting on our S3 bucket. We put a, a permission, um, a, a permission a bucket policy rather, um, that allows people to uh, fetch files from our S3 bucket. And then um, there's a multitude of ways to get files into S3, but the simplest one that we practiced was if we took our blog front end code, we dragged and dropped it into, into our bucket. Um, okay. So that's S3. Um, CloudFront is the other piece of technology, uh, complementary piece of technology that sits in front of S3 and really takes all the stuff in S3 and distributes it all across uh, the data centers that AWS manages. So it takes uh, files from S3 uh, and it distributes it to as close as possible to our users um, as AWS can, can get it. Um, CloudFront also has a couple of other um, uh, other features, such as um, TLS, SSL certificates. Recall that was the last thing we were dealing with on Thursday was um, issuing our TLS certificates for our, our domain name. Um, so CloudFront really is just taking our front end code and it's it's speeding it up. It's, it's optimizing the delivery of the front end code. Um, there really wasn't a whole lot that we needed to do with CloudFront other than setting uh, what CloudFront was pointing to and where we wanted things to be distributed. Uh, on Thursday, though, we were spending a lot of time on the SSL certificate. Um, so getting back to where we were on Thursday, um, let's go ahead and log into AWS. So to get to AWS, you can click on uh, the link that I'm about to paste into chat. I guess I could do better and give you an applicable link. There we go. And then instead of going to CloudFront, we're actually going to go to Certificate Manager first. So uh, to get to that, you can go up here into the box and start typing Certificate Manager. And then you should really only see one certificate right now. Um, and it should, it should match to the domain name that we were working on on Thursday. If you don't see at least one certificate, let me know. Um, but in your list of certificates, you should see at least one certificate in there. Again, if you don't see any certificates at all, please let me know. All right, and then by clicking on the certificate we were working on on Thursday, I'm hoping that everybody sees issued. Um, recall that on Thursday, we had set up this DNS challenge where um, we logged into Namecheap and we made these CNAME records to prove to AWS that yes, we are in control of that domain. Um, and at this point, you should have uh, you should have a certificate with green check marks for two kinds of domains: the regular domain and the uh, www version of your domain. 
if if you don't have these, please let me know. And it's totally okay if you if you don't have a success. Um, it might just mean that we copy pasted something wrong. Uh, go ahead, Brady. Uh, yeah, I only have the one domain and not the www dot. I think I missed a section of the video. So um, when you when you say you don't have a www, if you're are you looking at my screen right now? Yeah. Do you have the second row? No, I just have one domain, just the okay. um, website name without the www. Do you have a success for your main one? Yep. Other people. Same thing. Uh, did you, Brandon, did you click on the link under certificate ID on the first page? I probably. So you should have certificate manager, certificates, and then click on that weird letter number combination. Yeah, okay. so you, you've clicked into this, right? Yeah, that's where I am. Yeah, yeah. So the the only reason why you wouldn't have the WW version is if when you went to request a certificate, so like if my domain was asbf.com, the only reason why you wouldn't have um, a request for the WW version is if you hadn't gone and requested it here when you were making it. So um, when you go to request a certificate, you would type in ASDF, and then you would also type in the additional www version. Now, it's totally fine if you don't do the www version, but some people, when they go and visit, will uh, will type in the www version. So that just means that um, when you go to do your demo, or you know whatever you decide to do with the, your capstone, um, you would make sure that they just type in the non www version in the URL. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I honestly, I wouldn't redo it at this point. Um, I just added the www um, for for uh, completion purposes. Okay. Anybody else? Otherwise, I'm going to assume everybody's got a success, at least a success for one of their. Um... Okay. All right, so we've requested a certificate. Um, what this means is that AWS now knows that we control these domains. In my case, the domain I'm working on was, was called cohort three. Um, so we've proven to AWS by taking these random values that AWS generates and AWS knows. Uh, we've, we've proved to them we own the domain by taking those random values and uploading them to our domain name AWS was able to look, see that they match. Cool. I know that this person owns the domain. Now, we actually need to use this certificate over on our cloud front. So whenever we serve, um, whenever we serve uh, our website out of cloud front, it knows to use this uh, this certificate, this SSL certificate. And this is this should be pre pretty straightforward. Um, so let's go let's go back over to CloudFront now that our, our certificate is all squared away. And if you're looking in CloudFront, you should see a list of distributions. You can get to this uh, by clicking on this link or typing CloudFront up in the box. I've got a couple here. You should probably only see one distribution. Um, I'm going to click on my distribution. And then I'm going to hit edit under settings. So you should be looking at your distribution, looking at the settings for your, for your distribution. All right, under the settings page, we need to do two things. First thing we need to do is we need to add the domain names that map to our CloudFront distribution. So that's going to be the two domain names that we, uh, that we, the two domain names that we registered when we were uh, 
creating that certificate request. So mine was covert3.com. I'm going to add another one. So I'm adding the regular domain name and the www version of my domain name. Uh, go ahead, Artro. I'm a little lost. I'm sorry. So I went to CloudFront, clicked mm -hmm. on distributions, then I clicked on that string of characters, and below it it says like general origin behaviors error pages. Yeah. And then because your page looks different than mine. Oh. Oh, okay. Now it looks like that. All right. So what do I do from there? Click on the edit button over to the bar right here. In settings. Under settings. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Hit the edit button. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong, but then you, Artrell, didn't you like complete this part last class, after class? Oh, I think you might be right. Yeah. Yeah, this this stuff should be filled in for you, Artrell. We, I think we did this last time. Okay. All right, so I'll just follow. I just want to make sure I was in the right spot. All right, I'm good now. Thank you. Cool. So come in here and under the alternate domain name, Make sure that you have uh, the domains that names that you requested when you're doing your uh, SSL certificate. And then under the SSL certificate, custom SSL certificate, pick the one that uh, pick the one that you generated or the, the certificate that you requested. Okay. And then all the rest of these settings are, are perfectly fine. Save our changes. I'm sorry. Um, what was that? I have what my is... domain names in there. Yep. And then right below it, there's a custom SSL certificate. Mm -hmm. Click that drop down, select whatever the certificate is that you requested. Do you see it? I do. Thank you. Yep. And then down at the bottom, save changes, and we are done with uh, with the SSL certificate business. All right. This CloudFront uh, has transitioned from in success state to deploying. So it's going to take it a second for it to uh, pick up that SSL certificate, realize that it's being served from these new domain names. That's fine. We'll we'll just give it some space to uh, to configure itself. While it's doing that, we have arguably the most critical um, the most critical step remaining, and that is we need to take our domain and actually point it at CloudFront. Um, what is our domain doing right now in Namecheap? What is can anybody tell me what that domain is actually doing right now? I don't know what it's doing, but I feel like it's just kind of reserved. It reserved mm -hmm. like a lot online somewhere. Right. If we go and visit it, is it going to take us anywhere? I guess it kind of depends. If you used it for your portfolio, it might still have the old DNS records that point to GitHub pages. But if you if you bought a domain name for your capstone and haven't used it since you bought it, it probably isn't going anywhere. So what do we need to do? Well, you need to guess where what we wanted to go. Um, just. Is it like we did last time when we uh, made the first URL, but it wasn't secured? Um, yeah, we need we need to point the domain to uh, to where we have our front end files. Does anybody know where that might be? Without looking at the slides, because this is it's an S three, right? Yeah, there's an S three URL. Absolutely. There's an S3 URL. Does anybody remember where the other S where the other URL is? There were two URLs that uh, people pointed out when we first set this up. 
there's the S3 URL, which was unsecured. And then there's the CloudFront one. And we just got done making the TLS certificate for this. So if we go to, if we go to um, this URL, this is going to serve whatever our CloudFront has. So, so let's let's wire this up to our to our domain. Let's make our domain point to our nice CloudFront distribution that we have all set up over here in AWS. So to do that, um, let's from this distributions page up here in the top left. Um, there's the settings where we just went in and added the SSL certificate. Um, up here on details where it has our distribution domain name, grab that and copy it. And then let's come into Namecheap. So log back into Namecheap, go find your domain, click on manage. And then once you're here in the DNS records, just make sure that I have this. And once you're in, under the advanced DNS page, just like we did before creating the other CNAME records when we were proving that we own the domain, make a CNAME record. The host will be the at symbol, which just means this domain. And then the value, paste in that CloudFront distribution ID. Where is that part, please? Where is that one? Where is that last part, please? Uh, this uh, cloudfront.net part. Jennifer? Did, are you asking where did I get this value? No, I just wasn't sure where to go. So we're we're pasting in what we just copied from CloudFront, right? Yes. Yeah. So okay. here in this value box, yep, paste your your CloudFront distribution ID. Yep. And we got that back on this page uh, back here. Yep. Okay. What do we put for host? Because it does not like me. Um, host should just be the accent. Uh, in DNS terminology, the at just means this domain. So it's a shorthand for saying uh, whatever your domain name is. Hmm. It is not happy with that? Uh, no, I've got a warning symbol. I suppose I have to get rid of the HTTP part because that's what you don't have. Yeah, do you want to share? Uh, no, I got that. You didn't have the HTTP and I did, so that's uh, fine. I see. I um, I clicked, I copied this mm -hmm. instead of hitting the button. And if you hit the button, it gives you the whole HTTPS, yep. which we don't want. Yep. Good, good catch. Yep. Do not put the HTTPS uh, here. It should just be okay. without a protocol. Good catch. Thank you. Thanks. 
All right. So at this point, we should be able to visit our domain and it should take us right to our front end. I'm going to go and visit over three. That one. Fair enough. I've got a HTTPS SSL enabled front end. I can verify that by clicking on the little lock icon and see that in fact it is verified by Amazon. So at least on my, on my computer, I have a working front end. Is anybody else able to visit their website? Mm -hmm. H Jennifer, do you have HTTPS working and everything? It's all set. Yeah. Perfect. Actually, mine doesn't say HTTPS, but it does show a lock symbol. It does show the lock. Okay, cool. Okay. You may, if you click around inside the field, Jennifer, you might get the HTTPS to to show up. Sometimes the the browsers just chop it off. Yeah. Show sure. a lock symbol. Cool. Thank you. Nathan, I, I know I'm just auditing this week, but can I share my screen real quick? Absolutely. Let me stop sharing. So when I try to put in the at symbol here. Oh, it's good. Uh, yeah, this is a, this is a, uh, I just leave it empty. So I did that, and it said I can't use C name. Uh, can't use at C name records for the root domain. Um, uh, can you do an alias? How does that uh, switch it? Switch it from C name to alias. Oh, oh, oh! For the type. Oh, there, there is no, uh, I'm sorry, there is no alias. Uh, a record is going to have to point to an IP. Um, is this an office hours question? This is, uh, let's just, um, yeah, let's talk about it at the end. Okay. okay. I'll stick around yep. at least today. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So my... Uh... You're all at you are what out the WW works, but the WW does not work. Yeah, um, I believe that's because we need to add one more um, one more record. Uh, good good catch. So let me share my screen. So uh, back in Namecheap, add another C name record where the host is www. The value stays the same. And then you should be able to also load the www version. It, it might take it a second for it to propagate, but. And both of those should be working for you. And just to remind folks, even though we've got, um, we're uploading Max's front end, it should be as simple as taking your front end code and and um, uh, and replacing Max's front end code with it. So although we don't have your Capstone front end code deployed, it will be literally as easy as uh, dragging and dropping whatever Capstone front end code you have and replacing it. So again, we're just practicing with with Max's front end code. Um, just so just so that we all can be working from the same same code base. When we do replace it, do we have to make a new bucket or just um we'll use all the same stuff, all the same stuff. You won't need to make another cloud front, you won't need to make another S3. Um, it will be all the same. Okay. Anybody else not able to uh Schneider, did the WWW fix work for you? I'm working on it right now. Okay. Um, uh, Artro, go for it. 
Yeah, I had to um, reset my password to get the names cheap. So I've got that reset. So I'm now in there. So that's I'm behind at that step. Um, so uh, I think, again, I think we did this on Thursday when you stuck around. So you I know you at least have the at C name record. So if you go to your domain, click advanced DNS. All right. OK, domain list. Um, and then I see my don hmm. I see my domains, names, domains yeah. rather. So click on domains and then do you see a manage over on the side, like on my screen? Yes. Yeah, click manage on whatever domain you're using okay. for Capstone. And then uh, in the tabs, click on advanced DNS. Okay. And then you see a C name record, right? Like this one, like a host at. Yes. Yeah. So I know we I know we did that on the end, end of class. Um, if you want to have the WW version, which I would recommend, uh, also create another C name record, throw WW in for the host, and then uh, take the value of what you have for the at record and throw that in in there too. So you should have two two C name records, one that's uh, an at and one that's a WWW. All right. So I'm adding one and it's a C name record, right? Yep. All these are C names. All right. So host do www, then yep. grab that value from the at one. Yep, exactly. And then paste it down there as the target. Yep, paste that as the value, hit the green check mark. They're all good. Okay. And then if you visit your domain here in like the next five minutes, because uh, again, DNS takes a little bit of time to propagate, but um, if you visit that domain, you should be able to, uh, to, to see your working front end. All right, I, think fact, I, I know yours was working out. This is just to make sure that WWW is working. Got it. Um, yeah, Brandon. I think I might have found the issue one moment. Okay, no. Um, so yeah, whenever I try the CloudFront, uh, the CloudFront value or the name of my website, I'm getting access denied. Can I see, uh, can you share? Yeah. Yeah, access denied, ooh. Um, all right. Does anybody want to take, uh, okay, so here's the at record. The at record looks good. It looks like it points to a valid CloudFront. Take that value, the DDBY74, copy that to your clipboard. I'm sorry, uh, this one? Oh. Yep, copy that to your clipboard. Just open up a, yep, open up a, a browser tab, paste that in. In fact, that's what you have over there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, so, um, does anybody want to take a guess? Troubleshooting. Anybody want to take a guess at what they think this is? Okay. Looks like gibberish. Besides access denied. Can you open your inspection? Uh, I would. We do I would that? say since uh, since the what was that the uh, Cloudflare link? It's not working. So I would maybe start troubleshooting from there. Right. 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 You know, that's right. That's a good place to start. Oh. Exactly, Brian. Exactly, because we're we're dealing with CloudFront. We're not dealing with the the domain name. We're we're down at the CloudFront level. So it that means it's either at CloudFront or CloudFront S three. So if we think of the whole stack of of tech that we've piled together uh, since since Wednesday, um, we're talking about somewhere here in the middle. Um, so starting at the cloud layer. So let's hop back into AWS and look at CloudFront. On AWS, yep. Yep. I have them in different <laughs> browsers. Cool. So you've got, uh, so here you've got, um, here you've got CloudFront set up. I'm going to wager a guess that it is probably the fact that CloudFront can't reach S3. And maybe that's because S3 doesn't have the bucket policy. So let's open up the um, S3 service. So up in the top. Yep. 
S3. Take me to the bucket. Oh, there we are. So you've got big scary access. Cool. Take me to permissions. Oops. Scroll down. And you have a bucket policy. Okay, let's just check that resource real quick. Arn, AWS, S3, Capstone, Brandon. Scroll up to the top. This bucket is definitely called Capstone, Brandon. Okay, so uh, anybody can request files from here. Uh, take me to the properties tab. Scroll back up to the top. Take me to the properties. Scroll down from the very bottom. Show me the URL. Yep, click on the URL down here at the bottom. Oh. So we know we know that the S3 side of things is good. We know that the permissions uh, for S3 are good. Um, the There's something going on between CloudFront uh, and S3. So let's go back into um, CloudFront now that we know that this is good. Okay. All right. And then let's just click on the edit and check on the settings here. Um, alternate. So all this looks good. Uh, keep going down. Keep going down. All of this looks great. Okay. Hit cancel. Um, and then take us to the origins tab. Let's take a look at uh, how the bucket is set up. Um, click on this, and then let's go to edit. Oops. Um, um, <laughs> click this. All right, go back down to the bottom. Hit save. All right, let's try. Uh, let's try checking that out in the browser. Oh, oh, so can I just refresh? Mm -hmm. hmm. All right, so we've switched to not secure. Um, switch back uh, to the cloud front real quick. Is it still uh, modifying? Yeah, take us back to cloud front, go back to general. Oh, okay, so it's still, uh, it's still updating. I think, oh. uh, I think that was the problem there. Okay, so Let's, like, um, three, four minutes. Yeah, I think I think if we give it a minute, um, things will resolve themselves. Okay, awesome. I'll let you know. Thank you. I think, thank you. Uh, Shiner? Hi there. So for the WWW, I have CloudFront as the target. And then when I, you know, put it in and check it out, it's not secure. Why it's is that? not secure. Yeah, that's what uh, I tell you. Can you share your screen? Yeah. Yeah, uh, you see that? I was so force it HTTPS. Uh, what was that? Yeah, force it. So like uh, shove HTTPS colon slash uh, at the beginning of it. Gotcha. HTTPS. You can do that. Can force it to be secure. Well, yeah. I mean, you you can specify. I think what um, what we've grown accustomed to is websites will redirect you. So if you and we can do the same thing and come to office hours and I'll show you how to do it. They're called redirect rules. But if you go and visit a website using HTTP, nine times out of 10, the website will redirect you to HTTPS automatically. So you won't even notice it. Um, but if you want to specify HTTPS, yeah, there's absolutely nothing stopping you from, uh, from putting that in the URL. Okay. What if I was an end user and I didn't know that, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> would it do it automatically? Um, no, unless, unless you set it up to, um, again, come to office hours and I'll show you how to do that. Um, gotcha. but there is a, um, but no, if users, if you're, if your load balancer or whatever it is that is serving your website, if you don't have that configured to redirect HTTP to HTTPS, um, then yeah, users will, can choose whichever one they want. Um, All right. But, uh, as long as it is. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. Let's share my screen. All right, so uh, at this point, we should all pretty much have uh, 
some kind of working uh, front end domain complete with TLS. Um, and we've covered that. All right, let's talk briefly uh, about how to deploy changes. Um, there's two ways that I'm gonna show you how to do it. There's the quick and dirty way uh, that I'm about to show you right now. Um, and then tomorrow I'm gonna to show you how to do a completely automated version of this where you don't have to click as, as many things. Um, but today I'm gonna to just show you, you know, here's, here's how you do it using AWS uh, and going through the website. And it's, it's very similar to how we uploaded our code the first time uh, for the front end. But let's say that we wanted to make uh, some change to, to, uh, to our front end code, or let's say we wanted to upload our capstone. Um, at this point, I wouldn't upload your capstone though. Um, wait until we've uh, wait until we've got a working backend. But let's say that we wanted to make a change um, with GitHub Pages. Before I get into that though, with GitHub Pages, way back in week six or seven, with GitHub Pages, how do we make changes to our portfolio? Uh, We're deploying a portfolio. Go ahead. We make changes and uh, push it to the Ansible yeah. origin. Yep, yep. We would make changes, we commit them, and then we would push them. And then GitHub would take over, and it would do the do the deploy for us. We're actually gonna uh, we're actually gonna look at doing that tomorrow. But um, today we're gonna do something a little bit different. Instead of committing our code and pushing it up, we're going to drag and drop. Um, so same, same sort of thing we did for, for uploading the front end. So um, does anybody remember where we drag and drop our files into? Bucket. Into the bucket, exactly. So let's go to AWS console. Let's come into S3. Click on our bucket. Click the upload. Should see a very familiar screen. All right. Let's let's make a change. Um, let's make a change to the blog front end. So I've got my um, I've got my code over here in GitHub Desktop. Um, I'm going to quickly commit this. So uh, on my on my blog front end, it says uh, Max's awesome blog. I'm just going to change that to say Nathan's awesome blog, and then I'm going to I'm going to deploy that. Uh, feel free to to make whatever change you want. You can uh, rename it from uh, Max's awesome blog to your awesome blog. But uh, remember that when we're making changes to our code, um, if we're working on code that is inside of a Git repository, which the blog front end is, um, we always start from GitHub Desktop. So we open up GitHub Desktop and then either click on the open in VS Code here or go up to the top tab and click open in Visual Studio Code. So go ahead and open up the blog front end. And then I believe the code is Max's blog. That's the name of the title. So I'm going to change that to Nathan. And then Home.js says Max is awesome blog. I'm going to change that to Nathan. So just practicing, we can change to the front end to, to show what it looks like um, working on our front end code. Okay, you can make whatever kind of change you want. All right. Uh, go ahead, Archer. 
I don't know what it is. I kept my eyes off the screen for like three seconds and I feel like I got left back like by miles. <laughs> so so all I'm doing right now is I'm making a change to some front end code um, to show what it looks like to upload it to S3. So really deploying the front end. Um, if you uh, if you want to sit back and just watch, that's totally cool. Um, alternatively, you can uh, code along with me, make some kind of change to your front end, um, and then follow along as I as we deploy it to uh, to S three. It's up to you. All right. Okay, cool. So I've made some kind of change to the front end code. GitHub has uh, Git has noticed that I've made made those changes. So um, I'm going to just out of out of good practice, I'm going to go ahead and commit this. Moving from Max to Logan's blog. Come in and push that up. All right. So I'll just wait wait a, a couple of seconds for folks that are making changes to uh, to their copy of the blog um, to to do so. Okay, so I've made some changes to my front end code. Uh, what should I do now? Anybody remember what we did when we initially do a build? Do a build, yes, yes. Um, so instead of just going show in Finder, instead of just going in here and grabbing uh, grabbing stuff from source or from any other location, we need to run npm run build. We need to create that build folder or uh, at least regenerate that. I'm gonna actually delete my build folder um, to show that it gets recreated. So I'm gonna open up a terminal here in log front end at the top of uh, the blog front end folder. And then I'm gonna run npm run build. Notice how it created the build folder again for me. Now from within build, here are the files that I can use to upload. So I can take all of those files from build, drag them over to the upload for my S3, just like we did when we were first uploading our front end files, and click upload. Um, I got lost somewhere. Did you get lost in creating a, a change in blog front end? I did. Um, I'm okay. still a little behind. I, okay, I made the change. Mm -hmm. Stop, let me stop sharing and you can share your screen. I just wanna make sure I'm not missing the build part. I'm pushing the origin. Yep, you're committing and pushing to origin just because it's good practice. Okay. And then once you've done that, then you could do your NPM run build. Back in my code. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, looks like it went all right. Cool. No errors. Okay. <laughs> then all, all, you, all you have to do now is take the files and build, upload them to your bucket. So build's going to be, oh yeah, there it is. Do I just copy all of them? Just drag and drop all of it. I do that. Can I copy wish, the build folder itself? No, no, everything within the build. Do you want to share your screen so we can see? Yes, please. Cool. Okay. Yep, okay, so you've got everything in the build folder that probably the easiest way to do this is to um, hop back into GitHub desktop. Mm-hmm. Click that show in Finder 
so we can see all the code inside of yep that's where i that's where i got lost okay oh well now now it's detected some changes so those buttons have gone away but you can click up on repository up in the top bar yep there's another link to click show and finder perfect okay click into the build folder and then copy them from here exactly yep including static including static yep everything in build jag uh yep yep and where do i put it over there here yep okay scroll down to the very very bottom upload okay cool. all right so we've uploaded those files um and uh we now have made a change to our front end so we're practicing making a change to uh to our front end all right i'm going to stop sharing and then the one last piece that, that is remaining now so we've uploaded to s3 the one last piece that's remaining is that cloudfront doesn't know when you've changed files in S3. So remember, CloudFront is responsible for taking all of the files in S3 and distributing them all across AWS data centers. So CloudFront doesn't know when these files in S3 have changed, so it doesn't know when to go and fetch new copies. Um, you can configure CloudFront to automatically uh, refresh itself um, on some kind of interval, but because we don't have that set up, we have to go into CloudFront and tell it, OK, pull fresh files for S3. So update yourself for S3. I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, so go after you've up to, up, updated the files in S3, click into CloudFront, find your CloudFront distribution again. And regardless of if you were following along with us as we were making changes to the S3 bucket, you could do this right now um, alongside us in uh, on your in your CloudFront distribution. So go to CloudFront, look at your distribution that you have set up for your front end. There's a tab here up at the top, general origins, behavior, error pages. There's a tab up here that says invalidations. Click on that. We're going to create an invalidation. So click on that button over on the side. And what this is saying is it's it's asking us what kind of files do we want to re-request from S3? What kinds of files do we want to delete from the cache? And the answer is we want to delete everything. We want CloudFront to, to invalidate all the files it has and go fetch, fetch them brand new from S3. Um, and so to do that, the syntax for the invalidation that we want to write is simply slash wildstar, which is exactly what you think it means on, uh, on your computer. It's uh, from the path uh, forward slash wildcard, which means everything, right? Um, I think some people here have heard of like RMRF star or um, th that sort of syntax. It's the same sort of thing. We're saying invalidate everything you know about and go go fetch it brand new. So forward slash star, and then we'll create a validation. And then this will take, um, you know, maybe a minute or, or two. But um, once it's done, um, if we go back to our, uh, if we go back to our website and we refresh, we'll see that uh, the code has changed. And our changes that we uploaded to S3 are now reflected. Um, don't forget about this invalidation. Uh, you might upload code to S3 and forget to go to CloudFront and also uh, put the invalidation in there. Um, don't forget, because uh, that, that can kind of be frustrating. You go, oh, I've uploaded the code, but it's not showing up. Why is that? Um, don't forget about this CloudFront invalidation step. OK, any questions? 
Just waiting for mine to finish. Did you rename yours from uh, Max's blog to Jennifer's blog? Yeah, I renamed. Nice. Okay. All right. That is it for the front end. You now, you now know enough, and we've set up enough for you that uh, that you can now update and upload uh, your your front end code, make changes to it, and redeploy it. Um, we still need to actually take your capstone front end and move that into the S3 bucket, um, but that will, you know, at most take us a, a couple minutes. So, um, so we're done with the front end. Congratulations. Now we move on to the back end. Uh, what do I do if it's still processing? Um, so remember that the cloud front. CloudFront works across like 30 something data centers and I don't know how many different uh, zones. So that's a lot, that's a lot of places uh, that uh, the invalidation has to run across. It's uh -oh. very likely that it has already run in a data center close to you. So if you go and visit uh, your domain, does it show the changes? Um, no, it's giving me 404 not found. Uh, your domain? is giving you 404. Mm -hmm. Let me get yeah. the part and see if that makes a difference. Yeah, it doesn't show any, any change. Well, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. If you want to share your screen real quick. So okay, cool. a Jen's super cool blog or something like that instead of home. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, go back to, oh, it's still in progress. Okay, cool. Um, and then take me back to, uh, um, well, we definitely ran NPM run build. So we know that the code got updated. Uh -huh. um, Go back to the browser real quick and take me to the domain, the React app tab, whatever the don't, wherever your website is actually. Yeah, it's hard to see with that tab. Where do you want to be, CloudFront? Oh. Yeah, uh, it's it's live. I think it's just that uh, your browser is catching it now. Go back to React App and uh, hit Command Shift R. Just do a hard refresh. There you go. Awesome. So we can do the cache and validation um, in CloudFront, but that still doesn't uh, prevent us from caching in the browser. So. Oh, okay. Caches built on caches built on caches. All right. Um, so let's get a little bit of uh, a little bit of the way into our back end uh, before we before we break. Um, so real quick let's talk about uh, the next piece of technology so platform and s3 those are kind of the uh, that's kind of the bundle that we're using for the front end uh, elastic beanstalk is uh, the third piece of technology that we're going to look at and it is responsible for running the back end now um, elastic beanstalk is a bit different than platform and s3 in the fact that it deals with servers. Um, CloudFront and s3 just deal with files and replicating files across a wide number of data centers uh, Elastic Beanstalk, though, is more about um, renting servers and um, providing a location for you to run your backend code because we're not just hosting files. We actually have code that needs to run 24-7. Um, we also have databases. 
that's that's sort of the realm of what uh, we're about to start covering is is elastic beanstalk. Uh, so it's kind of a one stop shop for uh, for all of these things. Now, you can glue all of this together in AWS without using elastic beanstalk. Elastic beanstalk really is um, is um, is is a one stop shop that makes assembling all these different products um, easy. Uh, but as you'll see, uh, Elastic Beanstalk doesn't really cover everything. Um, we're going to have to kind of dig into some of the uh, some of the other products. Um, just like, for example, with CloudFront, we didn't stay in CloudFront the whole time we were working in it. We had to go over to um, the certificate manager in order to uh, generate SSL certificates. Uh, it's going to be the same thing here. We're going to start off in Elastic Beanstalk, but we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to go and poke around in uh, in RDS in order to. Uh, configure our database. And we're also probably going to have to look at uh, EC2. Um, so there's there's a lot of products that Amazon throws around. And there's a big words, word soup that I'm throwing at, uh, at all of you, but um, we're going to use Elastic Beanstalk to, uh, to set up for servers. It's good in the, the, the short um, description. Um, and yeah, we're going to use it to, to serve the, the uh, blog backend. When we get done with this, uh, it, we're going to reuse the same database, the same servers, uh, the same logging, everything um, that uh, we practice right now at the blog. We're going to reuse all of that for the capstone. So we won't need to go and create anything new in Elastic Beanstalk. Um, we'll just reuse um, all the, the same old stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump jump right into it. Here is the link to get to Elastic Beanstalk. And if that link doesn't work for you, again, uh, the fail, fail proof way of getting to Elastic Beanstalk is just to type in Elastic Beanstalk in the uh, product URL. Did that link work for anybody? Or did I give you, give you all? Okay, it worked, all right. So let's go ahead and click on create application. Um, I notice up in the top right, it's asking us if we wanna use the new or the old console. Uh, if yours says use the new console up there in the top right, click use the new console. We're gonna work uh, for most of this by using uh, the new Elastic Bean con Beanstalk console. If you don't click the use the new console up here in the top right, you're going to look at my screen and go, why does your stuff look so different than mine? Um, so click that use the new console. And then we'll hop into creating our first Elastic Beanstalk application. And here is that page for creating the environment. All right, application name. Let's name this something. Remember, we're going to end up putting our capstone here. So don't don't feel like you have to call this uh, anything about the blog. Um, so I'm going to just call this Nathan Capstone. And you can ignore most of, uh, um, you can ignore pretty much everything else up into the platform section where this is where we're gonna need to, uh, to select what type of code we're going to run on Elastic Beanstalk. We're gonna run Node.js code. Does anybody have a preference on Node.js 16 versus 14? Don't know the difference. Neither do I. Let's go with no chance 16. Uh, and then platform version, uh, let's leave that at the recommended 564. And then under uh, application code, there's a sample app. So AWS will upload a sample Node.js app for us. Let's just 
let's just let them do that. And then we want this under the presets. We want to leave that set to free tier eligible. So again, just to recap, we've named our application and we've set the uh, platform to Node.js. That's really all you've got to do on that page. I'm sorry, can you hold on a minute? It's not letting me do any of the things. Oh, yep, let me back up. And that name, it does not have to be the same as the name we used on our front end. Right, it can be whatever you want. It's not giving me an option to do new or old cancel at all. And it doesn't look like yours. I mean, it looks oh. like yours as set. It doesn't have a couple of options. Yeah. Um, let me stop sharing. You, there's probably a button to hit it. I could probably point it out. Go ahead. Yeah, this is usually the old one. Um, click back. Uh, let's just back up and click uh, back to Elastic Beanstalk. Um, wow, it really doesn't want to show you. Oh, can you refresh this page? Um, please hold. <laughs> wow, I don't think that, uh, I think that they're limiting the number of people that can use the new console. That's fine. Um, create application. We'll just do this in the old console, no big deal. Uh, application name, yep, whatever you want to call it. I was going to say, something happened to me. I just want to configure more options for the free tier thing. Platform Node.js. Node.js is about center in that list. Uh, yep. Right about there. That's right. Create application. And you're good to go. Just let this uh, keep this window open and let that run. Okay, for everybody else that's using the new console, we switch back. For everybody that's using the new console, finish filling all that out, click next. Would it ask you if you want to configure service access? Uh, just hit create and use new service role. So um, you may not have this same screen. Uh, everybody else able to see this? Did, did you get asked about service access? Okay, okay, um, yeah. Click create and use new service role if that's not already selected. And then move on to the next. Um, leave all of this as is, except for down at the bottom, when you get to the configure instance traffic and scaling page, go to the very, very bottom where it says instance types, we're gonna not allow T2 smalls. So let's just allow T2 micros. So just X out that T2 small. We don't wanna let it pick um, T2 smalls. This is down at the bottom under instance types. It's about the, the fourth from the last. And if you accidentally X'd the wrong one, um, you can always clear all of them and then retype in uh, the T2 extra small. That's the only one we want to allow to pick. Uh, or sorry, not T2 extra small, T2 micro. That's the only one we want to allow it to, to provision for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, where is that again? It's at the very bottom of this instance traffic and scaling. We're on step three. Are you on that? Yep, so scroll to the very, very bottom. There should be a little instance types. 
section? Not seeing it? No? Well, I've got more on my page than you do. No. Oh, interesting. Maybe not. So. And stop here. Scaling triggers, low to balance. Just try doing like a, a page search for uh, instance type. That's what I do. Jennifer, can you share your screen and show me? Because it's, it's possible other people are seeing the same thing. Uh, scroll up to the very, very top. Yep, okay. So and then, and then scroll back down. Keep going, keep going, keep going. There it is right there. T2 micro and T2 small. So scroll up just a little bit more. Right here. So okay. X, click the X on this, the T2 small. Yep. Couldn't find that at all. Perfect. Scroll down to the bottom. Keep going. Next. All right. Okay. I was looking for like a big box. Like, where is this? Thanks. Yeah, there is a there is a ton of uh, configuration options that you have. So, um, and it I don't know why I'm not getting the same like on my screen instance types was at the very very bottom, but it was different on yours. So. And I did the new console too. Yeah. Um, so now you're on step four, networking, database, and tags. We're not going to do anything here. We'll just keep keep skipping ahead. Go down to the bottom and hit next. And then this should be the review page of where. Nope, we still have a little bit more left to do. Um, let's leave all of this as is, and we'll come back and talk about this in a minute. Keep going hit next we're just going to let all this stay the same now we should be on the review page hit submit shouldn't get the error i did And there should be some blue spinning stuff, meaning that your environment is getting created. Does anybody hit, did anybody get an error like I did? Oh, but yours is gonna look a little bit different because the old console has that uh, stuff. Um, it's doing the exact same thing behind the scenes. So. Mine has a green check mark already for health. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, so this is going to be a good time for us to take a break. Um, assuming that you were able to hit submit and um, you've kind of got some uh, some stuff spinning up on your screen, um, you should be good to go. Um, so let's go ahead and take our, uh, let's meet back here at um, 7, 10, and we should be ready to uh, to start getting our backing code up. Right, see you at 7, 10. All right. So first off, welcome back. Uh, hopefully this has been enough time for your Elastic Beanstalk environment to get uh, up and running. Um, you can tell if your Elastic Beanstalk is running by hitting refresh and seeing uh, what the health of the environment is. It should say OK and give you like a, a green check mark. If you're using the old console, 
same thing. It should say help and give you a big green check mark. Um, uh, Alba, I'm very frustrated that I uh, was not able to find a link to give you uh, to try the new console. Have you had any luck being able to find a button that lets you switch? No. Um, I mean, there's an action button, but it's just no a blue. save configuration, clone environment, restart app server, rebuild environment, terminate environment. No blue button up in the top? No. Ugh. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, you're talking about all the uh, actions that you have. Okay. Um, let me turn around and ask everybody. Um, is everybody able to see the um, up at the top right? Do you still have a little banner that says use the old console? Mm -hmm. Yep. OK. Uh, let's all flip to using the old console. Should I wait until mine finishes? Oh, uh, no, no. Feel free to, to transition at any time. It's just going to change the front end code that AWS shows us. Oh, no. I have an error message. Now, no environment found for environment ID such and such. Um, so go back to the Elastic Beanstalk main page. So click uh, top left back to Elastic Beanstalk or type Elastic Beanstalk back in mm -hmm. the, uh, the bar. And um, And click back into your environment. Are you able to get get back to it? Yes. Cool. Um, so it tells me it's terminated. It tells you it's terminated. Oh, can you share your screen? Yeah. Okay, that's not good. So if I go back, one little space here. I get this. I can't see your screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. There we go. Terminated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um, well, can you click on it? Let's see what happens when you click on it. Gives me a big message. A problem occurred while loading your page. Well, that's very helpful. All right, let's just make another one. No big deal. Create new application. Hey, yep. Brandon, you got the same thing? Oh, no. Yeah, and then I uh, clicked on it, and then under events, and it has two errors. Fail to launch environment. Environment must have instance profile associated with it. Um. OK. So Brandon, follow, uh, follow, let's, let's try creating another one. Um, and see if that works. It could be that I limited us uh, when I did that T2 small reduction. It could be that that uh, uh, screwed things up. Um, and then uh, Gen Capstone 2. Okay, this sounds good. You go ahead and hit create. Um, oh, wait, we're uh, we're creating a new application. We don't want to do that. Um, we want to create a new environment. Uh, click that create a new environment yeah oh okay. web server cool scroll down platform make sure that's node.js next create the environment and because we're using the old console it's not going to make us go through all those new options so this is going to um this page is just going to provision all that stuff for us. So we'll leave it on here. Brandon, were you able to get to seeing something similar? Are you? Yep, I'm on the exact same page. Cool. Um, let's see, is there anything we could talk about while we're waiting on this? Uh, yeah, Kalai? 
I also have the same problem in like fail to launch environment and environment must have an instant profile associated with it. Okay, so let's let's um, let's create it using the old console. Um, can you share? Uh, can you stop sharing your screen, Jennifer, and uh -huh. switch over to the live for a second? Artrell, are you need? Did you hit a similar here? Mine completed. Uh, but do you still want me to go to the old console or? Yes, please. All right. We're all switching to the old console. Um, just so we're all looking at the same thing. Okay. All right. So, so I go back to a less um, to Beanstalk. Yep. Use old console and then do what from there? Uh, just just stay put. As long as you have an environment spun up, you're all you're all good. And, um, uh, I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. Um, okay. All right. Uh, so environment must have instance profile. Okay. Um, so fly up at the top right. Use the old console. Click that banner deal again right here. Let's switch to the old console. Perfect. All right. Let's click on the environments tab. And then go and create a new environment. Yep, select that. Give it uh, an application name. Cool. Scroll down. Set the platform to Node.js. And create environment. And then, um, Clyde, I'm going to pick on you for a minute just because I want to make sure that stuff is kind of cleaned up. So leave this going. Hop back to Environments tab. And then under the Terminated, can you clean that up? Can you click that checkbox and delete it? Um, yep. And then over on the Actions, there's nothing that you can do. OK except for restore environment. Okay, well, that's unfortunate. Um, so yeah, totally ignore this terminated one. All we're, all we're focused on is the uh, the new one. So if you click back into the Kali Capstone M1, um, yep, so it's creating all the stuff for your environment. And I think you should be good. So just a recap for folks, we're making sure that we're selecting the old console. Um, and if you have a terminated environment, uh, just let me know. Otherwise, uh, otherwise we should be all set. Is anybody stuck? Does anybody have any problems? Here, let me show you real quick what it should look like if your uh, if your environment is successfully created. So you go to Elastic Beanstalk, you click on environments. Um, you might see one or two, maybe one of them says terminated, that's fine. Pick the one that's not terminated. And then so long as you have a green check mark, says okay, you're you're good to go. Yep. Anybody have any problems? Mine's terminated as well. Yeah, so, sorry folks. Um, we should have just gone with the old console to, to begin with. Um, again, if your if your environment is messed up. Make make sure up at the top right. Uh, if it says try the new console, um, that means you're on the old one. So good. Um, just make sure you have the old console selected, and then um, go to the environments, create a new environment. Make sure you have Node.js, um, and you should be. Just make another one. Marshall, you have a question. I've been forgetting to put my hand down, but yeah, I got to create another one. Oh, okay, okay. I'll I'll give a minute for both folks to to create another one. Sorry, sorry about that. It's all good. I had to do another one too, Nate. If I had to like take a guess at what I think happened is like when you first go to uh, the Elastic Beanstalk, like the official page, there's a create application button on that page, and mm -hmm. like I think we're supposed to be creating the environment, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think yeah. that could be like I think so. Like going through that process creates the application and not an environment, and they look pretty similar. Like, so I, I think that's what happened. Yeah, that that makes sense to me. Um, the instance profile is uh, it's actually a part of EC two. Uh, so if we look at uh, um, yeah, instance profiles. Um, this is supposed to be something that uh, EC2 builds for you. And I, I think it's just a problem with their new console. So there's some things that the new console kind of does well. Um, and then there's something that the new console doesn't do very well. And, and I think we just hit one of the hiccups with it. Um, all right. Let me get back to... AWS, back to Elastic Beanstalk. Okay. Is anybody still waiting on an environment? Or are we mostly there? Two people, okay. Well, it'll take a moment. I mean well, so yeah. does um, I'm confused. I might be done. Mine says successfully launched the environment, but mm -hmm. on top of it, it still says this will take a few minutes, and it says creating. So, okay, yeah, I think that like it. For example, on my screen, you can see that it successfully launched the environment, but uh, it took it another twenty something seconds before I finally got a, an EC2 instance. Okay, yeah, I just finished up. So, yeah, thanks. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, Artrell, how are you looking? You mind if I just share my screen? Please do. All right. So I'm getting this. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it's still it's still building stuff. Um, you don't have to stay on this page. Uh, in fact, it's probably easier to just go back to the environments tab. Yep. Yeah, Mice there. took a while, like I'd say at least like a few minutes. It's it's a while. Yeah. Click into That's that. Kind of uh, yep, click into the environment here. Oh, okay. So it, it's still waiting for the EC2 instance to, to come up. Um, which is arguably one of the slower things. But it looks like you're real close. All right, when this is, when should I click back into my environments? Um, I think it'll actually redirect you when it's done. In the meantime, would you like us to do a group code review of your Capstone React frontend? Oh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I had, I was having difficulty for a couple of days and Max was like, what does it say in the um, on the browser part? And I kept reading it, and I finally figured it out. I was trying to get no, that's not it. This I was trying to get this to work, and this finally I finally got it by changing this right here because I had the old style. I had to do it in JSX, mm -hmm. so I had the uh, quotation marks. So I had to do the brackets. Nice. This was giving me so much agita. Right, but wait, there's wait, still wait, wait, more wait. I got to do. Wait, border one plus solid plus is that actually legal? Don't you need white space in between? Well, this is what popped up. Wait, wait, but but uh, this I don't think this is legal. It can't be legal. <laughs> I, I think. Uh, hold on. Now, now you peek my uh, right click, right click uh, somewhere on here. Let's get the inspector open. You, right okay, so you've got the inspector. Um, go to elements tab. Let's look at the form. Okay. Open up. Yep. Yeah, open up body. Scroll there. Find the. Okay. Never mind. Grab. Click that. So this? we can. Oh. Here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, click into that. Or click yeah. it once, I guess. So it's blue. And then click on the form somewhere. Yeah, there we go. Okay, now I click the form, form element, or. All right, hold on. Where'd it go? There it is. 
Yeah, click on the, the form element. Uh, like click on the form tag. There you go. Uh, we're missing your border. So my border didn't show up? No, I didn't. Huh. There should be a, like a one pixel deal here, right? That's what don't, don't, you, don't you still have to specify that it's pixel? Like I see this the one, but doesn't Ooh. like. Ah, you know, I got rid of it. So I think you're right. But now wait, I'm getting that. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. Back, back, come back into, come back into the inspect. Let's, let's try it out in element style. Let's see. Uh, so border. Click it. Yeah. Click in the box. Yeah. Until, yeah, there you go. Border. When we type the word border in there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're going to, we're going to add a border CSS now. Oop, border and then tab. 1px space solid oh i see it. it it just popped up right here right did everybody else see that there's now a 1px oh yeah order all right did the uh, did the environment get created <laughs> Do you have if I leave that over there, it stays? <laughs> uh, no, it's it's only going to stick around in the browser. Uh, you'll have to still make the change in uh, in code in order for it to finally. So real quick, if I put PX in there, I get I get. No, the, no, we, that's that's it. We've run out of time. Uh, or see, I'm just kidding. No, yeah, you um, you put it in quotes. I mean, yeah, you want it in quotes, uh, and you want white space in between it. So. Like, like instead of concatenating strings, instead of adding all the strings together, you can make it one big string. Yeah, one px, and then drop the pluses. Uh, it's just one px space solid space. And then you you wouldn't need the quotation marks in between because you're just building one long string. So, yep, drop the quotation mark there. Drop, yep, that one too. And then drop these two, keep that trailing one because that closes the string, but then drop these, these two here, backspace, backspace, space. There you go. Hey, and it, uh, it showed up. So your style is totally valid. Thank you. Cool. Uh, is the Elastic Beanstalk done? Well, let's take a look and see. Uh, da -da -da. uh you're getting a load balancer uh can you refresh this page maybe it's uh, oh. hey very cool and we did some css nice awesome thank you <laughs> you're right you're welcome all right Cool. All right. So what do we have? Uh, so over here on the right, you can see that we're running Node.js 16 um, underneath the hood. It's running on an operating system. Uh, Amazon has its own uh, has its own Linux distribution. So that's really cool. What can we actually do with this? Well, we can now upload our backend code. And I'm going to show you again. I'm going to show you kind of the long way of doing this. And then um, we'll eventually switch to doing this in a much, much quicker fashion. Um, so the the way I'm going to show you tonight is simply uploading and, and deploying, and we're going to drag and drop files again. It's just a, a little bit different than S3 because we're doing backend code. So to do this, we need to take our backend code to deploy it. When you take our backend code, we need to zip it up and then upload it. And um, the easiest way to do this, again, is always going to be to go into GitHub Desktop. we're going to deal with our code at all, we need to always start from GitHub Desktop. So opening up GitHub Desktop, going up into the repo picker, because remember, we are looking at the blog front end right now. So switching to the blog back end, because we're switching gears, we're looking at back end code now. And then you can either click that show and finder or up in the top bar, click show and, show and finder, either one of those 
two things will work. Okay. So you should have your blog backend code open in Finder. To upload your code, we have to zip it up. This is just one of the things that Elastic Beanstalk wants us to do. It's not like S3. We can't just drag all these files wholesale over. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to select all of this, all of these files, right click, compress. It's going to take all of it and package it into a zip. Um, Nathan, real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. if I have no modules. Do I need to delete those before I zip it? Um, good, good question. I uh, totally. It's just going to save you on file size. And um, when Elastic Beanstalk runs your code, it's automatically going to do an npm install and recreate those no modules. So say, yeah, exactly. Save yourself some of the space um, and the time when you're uploading. Feel free to delete those. Thank you. Yep, yeah, thank you. Great question. Okay. Select them and do what? So after select all of the files that are that are there in your in your um, backend code. Select all the files, right click and hit compress. You should get like archive.zip. So all of your backend code should be in a nice little zip, zip folder. And uh, just a reminder to get to your backend code, to get to this page, open it up in GitHub Desktop. Open up GitHub Desktop, click Show in Finder, and you should you should see the same window that I'm looking at. Anybody having problems zipping up their their backend code? Okay. So then from Elastic Beanstalk, we're going to upload and deploy. So we'll click that. And when we choose file, we'll go to that, uh, we'll go and select that same file, that zip file that we created. Um, to get to where you created that zip file, at least on my computer, it's in my documents under GitHub. So go to documents, GitHub, and then the, the name of the folder where your backend code is. So blog backend. And then I'm going to select that archive. That's it. So once again, to get to that same same place where you created the zip file, uh, just get to to some place on your computer like desktop, and then go. Um, Go over to your documents in the GitHub folder. That's how you can navigate to your zip. Unfortunately, uh, you can't drag the zip file over. That would be too convenient. Does the version label matter? Because my does the version label matter? What? Yeah, does the version label matter? It does. Um, this is this is useful for for you. Um, it doesn't really. It uh, you can name this whatever you want. It's kind of like a commit message. Name it something that will be helpful to you. So, uh, in my case, I'm just calling it my app one. Um, you might also call it something like uh, initial deploy to um, to make it known that this is what your um, this is what your original your first deploy is. But uh, it really doesn't matter what you call the version label. All right, thank you. <laughs> and then once that's done, hit deploy. So we're taking the zip and we're 
pushing it up to, uh, to elastic beanstalk. So we're taking our back encode and we're moving it, uh, moving it up. Uh, go on. You did compress the file to zip it, right? Yes. Back end. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Again, so um, I was in here in my back end code. Let me move the zip to, to the trash. I grabbed all the files, selected all of them. I'm using command A to select all on, and then hitting compress, and that creates the zip, shows everything to the zip. Is anybody not able to upload and deploy? Anybody not able to deploy some backend code? Uh, yeah, I'm just having a hard time finding the zip file. Uh, do you mind sharing your screen? I'm, it's kind of tricky, so I'm sure other people would appreciate seeing it. Okay. So have you made the zip in? It's good. You did? Okay. So click um, from this finder window. Yeah, click on documents. Go to GitHub. This is where all those repos are stored. Perfect. And then blog back in. And then here it is. Okay. Perfect. Open. And then you can call the version. Yep. Just hit deploy. You can call that version label, whatever you want. So no. Cool. So you've uploaded your first set of backend code. I can sleep at night now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so you've got a working front end, and we are just now starting to deploy the backend code. So you're doing great. Schneider? Um, I have a warning on my health. Uh, do you want to share your screen? Uh, environment health, environment health is transitioned from info to warning. 100% of the requests are failing with HTTP 500. That's not good. Yeah, that doesn't sound too good. <laughs> <sighs> so no, that's, that's the same uh, problem. <laughs> you got the same thing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Spoiler alert, if you're getting errors, then that means that you're doing just fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep, you're doing just fine. Um, uh, Archal, are you getting the same issue? Mine says severe. <laughs> severe. Okay. So <laughs> our health, our health for the application is going to go from um, uh, is going to degrade significantly. So, yep, you're you're. Uh... you're it's it's going uh, as intended. Um, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen real quick. Um, unfortunately, mine is still running, which is not, it's not what I want. Uh, so let me just real quick make sure that I have my code uploaded. Deploy. Here we go. Deploying new version. Okay, so I think that my first deploy um, didn't actually kick off. Now it's finally deployed. So if your Elastic Beanstalk is crashing, then um, you're uh, things are going correctly. Um, mine, on the other hand, refuses to crash. I want to know why. Mine didn't crash either. It is certainly it is certainly crashing, but my health page is not going. Uh, My health page is not going um, unhealthy. Um, is that because we don't have the rest of the back end done? Exactly. Yes. Yep. Um, so I'm actually going to um, 
I'm going to actually recreate my Elastic Beanstalk environment, but I don't need it working on my screen in order to, to be able to talk uh, talk through this. So what's what's happening? Why is it crashing? Well, um, let's let's first we like Jennifer pointed out, there's some some serious problems in their back end, like we're missing the database, for example. Um, but let's uh, let's if we didn't have these guesses, how would we know what's what's going wrong? Um, so the first thing the our best friend is logs. Um, so we're going to, uh, huh, this is crazy. My app says that it's just fine. Um, anyways, so we're gonna go look at the logs and try to understand why uh, why Elastic Beanstalk is crashing. So over on the left, there should be a uh, item called logs. Do you see logs over on the side? Mm -hmm. So click on logs, and then you should see something about a log file. Uh, click on that log file. We're going to download that log file and open it up in our browser. Do you see something similar to my screen? Do you have a bunch of logs mm -mm. that have shown up? Did it down try to download a file? Am I supposed to do request logs? Um, yes. If there weren't logs there, um, click request logs. Um, let's do full logs. Does that show some stuff now? Okay, great. Um, so grab whatever, download whatever log file. Um, so apparently if you do the full logs, it downloads a whole file, which is fine. Um, yeah, actually, that's that's too much. Let's not do full logs. Um, when you go to the request logs, let's do the last 100 lines instead of downloading the full logs. <laughs> All right. If you if you download or sorry, if you request the last 100 logs, do you see something a bit more like what's on my screen? It should just be one file with a bunch of logs in it. Okay. So let me let me walk you through what you're looking at right here. So the very top, ignore that. The second set of logs is what you're interested in. This web.standardout.log. Do you see this in, in your logs? So think of think of what you're seeing on your screen as a um, bunch of different log sources all smushed together. There's logs coming from the server. There's logs coming from the load balancer. There's logs coming from, um, from the uh, reverse web proxy. There's all these different things that are giving us logs. 99% of it is just noise. All we care about is the web.standardout.log. And that's because that log represents what you have what you have gotten used to when you run Node.js locally, when you say npm run or Node.js or, or node and then pass in the name of the file. So think of what you see in web.standardout.log. Think of that as what you see in your terminal when you're running your backend locally except this log is coming from servers. It's not coming from running uh, locally in our machines. So we have to use this uh, log to be able to tell what's going on um, with our application. So looking at the log, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of rely on you guys because my, my app is misbehaving a little bit. Um, in the logs, do you see anything that says econ refused 5432, similar to my screen? Can I just pick on somebody to show me their logs? So I think mine is 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 gross. I think I see one in mine. Brian, oh. do you mind share sharing your logs? Uh share my side. Do you see Perfect. it? Perfect. We got the okay. same exact logs. Okay. Yeah, right. it's uh, right here. Yep. Yep. So um, if you don't mind, uh, just leave me your screen up, Brian. Um, what is 5432? Does anybody know? Uh, is that a port? It's a port, yep. What's special about 5432? It's our backend port. It is a port used by the backend. And using API calls with 
let's look at the, some of the context around it. So it's a connection refused error. So we know that something is failing to talk to something. Sequelize connection refused error. What is sequelize? Database. Database sequelizes the driver we use to talk to our database. So it's saying, I can't talk to whatever is on 12700.1 on port 5432. It's not um, anybody remember what 127001? Does anybody remember what that means? Anybody remember what local post means? I was gonna say, is it our local? Um, quick question. How yes. did you guys get the uh the log? Um Brian, do you mind showing that tab where you requested the logs? I, th I think I see you still have it open to the left. Yeah, so uh, by clicking on the logs um, over on the left and then hitting that request logs. Gotcha. You okay, that? thank you. Cool. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take over screen share because I think we all pretty much have the same logs, even though mine isn't crashing the same the same way. Go back to share my screen. Okay. So we're not able to talk to the database. Um, and that makes sense because this is saying that I can't communicate um, with uh, the, a local computer on 5432. Well, we don't have a database running. So uh, of course it's going to die uh, on 5432. So that's gonna be the, the next step. We're gonna go and spin up uh, a database so that our backend can talk to uh, to Postgres. Elastic Beanstalk makes this pretty easy. So let me show you how to, uh, how to set up a database. We're going to go back to um, Elastic Beanstalk and we're going to click on the configuration page. Configuration just has all of the settings. Uh, this is all that stuff that we skipped over. Um, when we were initially setting up the environment using the new console. If you use the old console, AWS fills all this in for you. Um, but if you were using the new console and following along with me, which ended up not working, but if you were using the new console, all of those settings that we saw, th that's what you can customize on this page. Um, so what we're going to, um, what we're going to uh, update is down here at the very, very bottom, there's a database section. The very bottom of the configuration page, there's a database section. We're going to click edit there. And we're going to tell AWS that we want a Postgres database. So if you click on that, uh, it should pre-populate with my MySQL. Switch that over. We're going to use Postgres. For the instance class, change the instance class to a DB T3 micro. Yep, DB T3 micro. I'm not sure if this matters too much, but my Postgres is version 15. Should I change that or is it cool as for 14.6? Um, um, I'm just going to go with 14.6. I think it, it won't really matter a whole lot. Um, maybe just for safety sake, uh, go with 14.6 so we all know we're on the same one. Okay. All right, for the username, um, you can. this is going to create the Postgres user. So I, I don't know if Max um, mentioned this when y'all were going over uh, Postgres together, but um, for the username, so, so you need a user in order to log into Postgres. For the username, I'm just gonna call mine main. And then for the password, I'm going to, um, I'm going to generate a password. Uh, using uh, one of my password managers. But um, you can 
create whatever username and password you want for your Postgres user. Just make sure that um, whatever the username and password is, you write it down and, and keep it somewhere safe. I'm sorry, you said to create a password or? Yep, yep. So uh, um, use whatever um, name and password you want. Just make sure you write them down somewhere. So just to recap, we're creating a database, setting it to Postgres. Instance class should be dbt3 micro. Uh, the default storage of five gigabytes, I think will be fine for all of us, unless you're storing large images uh, in your database. Username and password, whatever you want it to be, just make sure you write it down. Um, availability, set that to low, leave that set to low. And then for the deletion policy, the very last um, little combo selector box, uh, set that to delete. We don't need to keep uh, a snapshot when we delete our database. And then you should be able to hit apply and it will create a database for you. Start spinning up a database for you. My apply went away when I put delete. Um, do you mind sharing? Scroll down. Your apply when it did. Uh, scroll up. Uh, scroll down. <laughs> um, I'm trying to see why it would take the apply away. Um, go click on create snapshot again. <laughs> go away. Um, Uh, can you change st uh, storage from like five to six or something to try to get AWS to understand? Uh, like up that by one, maybe. Scroll down to the bottom. Is it going to let you apply now? What in the world? Um, just refresh this page. We we got to fill it out again. Unfortunately. Maybe maybe try just hitting continue. That might just like because uh, I hit continue and I think it, it kept all of the settings. Okay, so uh, switch over to yep, same thing. Postgres instance class T three micro. Scroll down. Scroll down all the way. Keep going, keep going. Should our endpoint be undefined currently? T3 micro. Um, one point. Oh, for the, um, for Elastic for the database. Yeah, no, for the database. Um, it, we will find that out here in a minute. Oh, okay. Okay, scroll down. Yep, delete on the database. Apply. Sometimes the AWS UI is really wonky. <laughs> oh, it doesn't. Um, it, did you put a white space in your password? No. You could use that suggest strong password. Oh, did this just pop up? Um, hit cancel. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, sorry about that. It, the AWS UI is a little wonky sometimes. Cool. Anybody else having problems creating a database? I have a giant error message again. Bring it on. Awesome. 
It just severe. <laughs> yeah, we like that. That's good. That's what we right. want. We want to see because uh, right now we got problems uh, with our database. So, uh, or sorry, we have problems with their back end. Uh, the database is is coming up, so we're we're making progress. But uh, but right now our app should be crashing because with that database, yeah. Cool. We're in trouble. Uh, but while I've got you, Jennifer, click on uh, click on that endpoint. The um, the little link that you see right here. So this is the URL to our back end. Um, if you double click on that, 502 bad gateway. So yep, it's totally, totally borked. That's what we want to see. Okay. Schneider, was that what you were asking about with the endpoint? Mm -hmm. It was. Um, yeah. Secondly, my screen isn't going back to that running version screen. It's just stuck on a config. Um, so if you go, but if you navigate back to the um, environments page, uh, do you see something similar? Like, um, does it show the uh, recent events like on Jennifer's screen? No, because oh, when I try to go back, it's like, um, are you sure? Because something about configuration is pending. Can you share your screen? Yeah. Uh, how do I do that? Share screen. Um, you have pending configuration changes. Uh, we scroll, hit K X, yeah. Uh, scroll to the top. Is there anything actually here? Just hit cancel. That's fine. If there okay. are any pending changes, we'll, uh, or yeah, sorry, leave page. If yeah. there are any, changes, we'll figure it out. Gotcha. Yep, click back and then uh, show me the events. Do you have, I don't think the database uh, configuration change actually took. So, um, yeah, click, click open that. Uh, that side hamburger button. Go to configuration. Yeah, scroll down. Yeah, sorry. No, all good. Postgres. It was uh, T3. micro. T3 micro, yep. It's like three quarters of the way down. Gotcha. T3 mm. micro, yep. <sighs> cool, yep. And now it should be requesting. Nice. Nope. Archo? Can you cancel the screen sharing for me? My Zoom. Yeah, I got you. All right. So mine. Where the heck is Zoom? My environment is still updating. That's okay. If you share your screen, um, we'll, we can take a look real quick and make sure we're all on the same page. Right, can you see it? Yeah, yeah, this looks good. Just scroll down a little bit. Show me the recent events. Are we spinning up a database? Yep, created an RDS database. This may take a few minutes. That's perfectly fine. You're doing great. All right, thank you. Yep. All right, uh, anybody else? Otherwise, it kind of looks like we're pretty much, we've got an RDS database spinning up. So we're standing up a Postgres instance and we're plugging it into um, to our Elastic Beanstalk. Okay. Should Postgres be running? When you got done clicking the uh, apply on that database page after you entered in Postgres T3 micro, after you hit apply, um, Postgres was started. Oh, gotcha. Now, we aren't connected to it. And um, let's talk about why we might not be connected to it. So. The way that Postgres works in Elastic Beanstalk is going to be a little bit different than we, how we have our code wired right now. Um, we need to update our code in uh, the blog to connect to the correct uh, Postgres instance. And the way that you do that is by using these property variables. Um, so 
when you upload your code to Elastic Beanstalk, Elastic Beanstalk injects these properties that you're able to access from your application. Specifically, specifically the host name, which tells you where the RDS database is located, at the port that it's running on, and then what those other values were that you had at the username and the password. Um, and what we need to do is we need to wire that into our SQLized connection um, inside of our blog. So we need to tell our app how to connect to that Postgres. Okay, so let's let's get let's try to get this uh, database uh, connection wired up, um, and then we'll call it for for tonight. Um, all right, to do that. We don't actually need to do anything on the Elastic Beanstalk side. We just need to make changes to our code. Um, and I'm gonna drive, we'll uh, kind of agree on what the code needs to look like um, just by watching me. And then I'll post post my code for, uh, for everybody to use later. Does that sound good? All right. So um, I am looking at front end code right now. I need to switch to back end code. So I'm going to my blog back end, and then I'm going to open up Visual Studio Code. Does anybody know where uh, the SQLize connection is created in our app, in the blog back end? Does anybody know where we actually connect to the database? Did you say back end? Yeah, in the back end, the blog back end. Does anybody know where we actually connect to the database? And, um, um... Crap, I forgot the name for it. It's inside the DB file though, the folder. Yep, yep exactly. I, it's a it's a db.js, exactly. It's called like a module or something. I've heard. So I've got my if you if you check out my screen, I've got um I've got db.js um open. So can anybody tell me what needs to change here? The 5432. 5432. Yep. Yep. Does anybody see anything else? 5432 is one thing that needs to change. Does anybody see anything else that might need to change? Is it maybe the export? The export. On the bottom. Oh, the module export? Yeah. Um, I think so. Is it localhost or is that the same thing as 5432 needing to change? Yeah, it localhost needs to change as well because we're not talking to our computer when we're deployed on AWS. Um, we're going to be talking to a remote database. So we're going to need to change this, we need to change that, we're gonna to need to change that, and we're gonna to need to change this. So we need to change this entire line based on whether or not we're running on AWS, okay? Does anybody know, does anybody know what hack up state is? In this context, user name. Uh, it is. Yes, Kalai, you're absolutely right. This is the username. Um, if we had set a password, it would have looked like this. So there would have been a colon, and then you could supply the password after it. But because we were running, because we're running Postgres on our computers, and when we install Postgres on our Macs, we don't require password authentication. Um, you don't have to pass uh, any kind of password in uh, in here. Um, so what does that mean? Well, that means that we need to do we need to do two things. Um, so if we're running on Elastic Beanstalk, use Elastic Beanstalk connection. If we're running locally. use the local host connection. So we kind of have two different um, scenarios. 
when we're locally developing, we want to use this SQLized connection, right? Because when we're developing locally, we want to connect to our local, our local database. But if we're running, if we push our code up to Elastic Beanstalk, we don't want to try to make the same connection because this none of these credentials work. We're not talking to localhost, et cetera. Does that make sense? My concern, I guess, is like the password part. Would you like encrypt it in that URL or would you have to put in your actual password? Yeah, good, good question. So we're not going to type the password in and I'll show you, um, I'll show you how we get around actually, actually putting the password in. So what we, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a variable called DB and we're not going to put anything in it. I'm going to comment this out for right now. So we're going to start off with an empty variable called DB. And what we're going to do is we're going to see if there is a, we're going to see if there is a environment variable coming from Elastic Beanstalk called RDS host name. And this is this is one of the magic um, one of the magic variables that Elastic Beanstalk will automatically give you if you're running on uh, if you're uploading your code to Node.js. Again, these are the uh, five magic uh, variables that Elastic um, provide will inject into your app. Um, so here's actually an example down here. Um, it's a little bit different because uh, this is um, this is Node.js code that's not using SQLize. This is actually using uh, the raw MySQL driver. But um, down here, you could see that they're calling the same exact variables. So um, if they are running on Elastic Beanstalk, you can see that they're creating a MySQL connection using these special variables. So we're going to do something similar. But what we're going to do is we're going to test and see if this, um, if this variable exists and it's not empty, so if hostname exists, if the variable exists, we're going to create a database connection. And comment this out. And then we're going to template in those variables. So I'm not sure if uh, Max has done this with you before. Is anybody is are folks familiar with the templating syntax? Mm -hmm. So the first thing, um, as Kamai pointed out, the first thing in the string was actually the username. So I'm going to go and steal that. The second thing was the um, the password. So I'm not actually typing in the username or the password here. I'm just uh, referencing those variables that hold both of those values. And then we're going to do the same thing here. This is the RDS um, host name, I believe. And then the other one was RDS port. So instead of putting 5432 in there, do the same thing. Yes, port. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Stop. Stop sharing. Um, Brian, did you have a question? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. That whole time I thought I was talking. That's crazy. All right. Um, yeah. So that um, the uh, the if statement. I have a question <laughs> regarding the the syntax of the if statement. So sure. you're checking for the host name, and it uses a uh, it's checking like against a quote. Now, like, what if something was in there? Like, what if something pre-populated for the host name or like anything? Like, would it bypass it and I guess my second question would be would this would it work if the same if you just put if 
process.env.rds hostname and just like left it like that. So basically saying like if that variable exists or. Mm. So um, what uh, what values in Node.js are truthy? Uh, so uh, you would probably know better than me because I'm not a Node.js expert, but I believe that values that are truthy are not empty strings, not empty lists, the Boolean, uh, the Boolean true. Um, so could we write if process.env.rds hostname like you're suggesting? I think so. Um, I'm just being overly cautious and saying uh, if process.env.rds hostname. Sorry, did I have equals there before? Yeah, you had equals. Sorry, That's why I was like, okay, yeah. Yeah, um, sorry. Okay, it, that, that makes it, way more sense now. Okay. Yeah, if it was empty, then yes, I, that would totally be a bug. Uh, great catch. Thank you. So if we do have an RDS host name, if it's not equal to blank, then we want to set up a, a database connection. Good catch. Thank you. Otherwise, RDS host name is blank, meaning that we're not running in Elastic Beanstalk. Therefore, let me move this if statement in here so it's nice and connected. Therefore, um, we will use the old method of connecting to the database. So then this allows us to run our code, uh, continue to run our, our backend locally and connect to our local database, or if we upload it to AWS, um, it will then connect to uh, the RDS database on AWS. Okay. Um, before I copy and paste this code um, into chat, I'm just going to quickly um, I'm going to quickly compress this and upload it and just make sure that uh, this actually runs. So please bear with me. Would the local host database act as a fallback, or is that just there, just to be safe? Like. Um, it's it's there to um, allow me to continue to work uh, locally. So if I go to my documents, GitHub and blog backend, I can install load server dot JS. Equalize host not found. It's not bad. It's to allow me to continue to um, develop locally and to continue to run my um, my database locally, but it's saying that it can't connect to. It's saying that it can't connect to my local database. Let me just add console. Let me just add some console logs here. Um, so connecting to RDS. Server running, connecting to RDS. So we're still trying to connect to RDS. So if process and RDS hostname is not equal to blank, why would this be triggering? Um, What if what if process.env does populate, but it populates with like not an empty like an empty string or something like besides that? Good point. Let's print out what it thinks uh, RDS hostname is. Undefined. Ooh. Ooh. How would we how would we get a how would we do the check then if it's coming up as undefined? Could you check for null? Would null equal undefined? Uh, so we could do this. I mean, if we could also just straight up do a check on if it's undefined. Um, in which case, if I do that, it looks like I'm getting a completely different error and it's uh, it looks like we're connecting to local database. I think the problem is, is I don't have a user called hackup state on my computer. Um, there we go. And now I'm just missing, 
now I'm just missing a column on my table. Um, so these are unrelated errors. Uh, so we could do it this way. We could do, we could straight up check to see if it's undefined. Um, alternatively, we could switch our logic to this, which if it's undefined, this will end up being uh, false and it will bail into the else condition. Make sure I'm not lying. Yep. All right. So um, that is the reason why uh, Schneider is a very long way to answer your question. That is the reason why um, we have the if else section there. We have this if clause to um, form the correct DB connection when we're running on uh, Elastic Beanstalk. And then we have the else clause to um, connect to our local database when we're running on our local machines. Okay, let me move this to the trash. Take all this. I'm going to upload my backend code uh, just to prove that this can uh, successfully connect to a database. Um, I'm going to go back to Elastic Beanstalk. I'm going to upload and deploy again. I grab that zip. I'm going to initial deploy to school. I'm going to hit deploy. So if this worked, um, our app should uh, should stand up, connect to Postgres, and we should be further than um, where we're at. Down here, we can see the uh, deploy is going out to all of the different servers that we're running. And if we want instance deployment, it's completed successfully. So we're going to hop over to the logs page and see how the logs are going. We're going to request the last 100 logs. Take a look. And you can see here that we're still connecting to 127001. And you can also see that there's not a log message uh, saying, um, remember that we added in our code, um, we added these console logs. So connecting to RDS, connecting to local database, I don't see either one of those. So I'm fairly certain that the logs, uh, I'm fairly certain that the deploy hasn't finished. So we'll, we'll just hit refresh again, request the last 100 logs. OK, it looks like we're still waiting on logs to finish deploying. Or sorry, we're still waiting on our app to finish deploying. Instance deployment is successful. Instance deployment completed. Let's go back and request logs again. And we're still connecting to 127001. OK. Oh, here we go. So these are our new logs. The, this is, these are the old logs up here. And then notice how it jumps to these new logs at, as of three minutes ago. Now we are moved on to the next error, invalid ELF header. So we have moved past the database connection issue uh, to our next, uh, next deployment hurdle. And with that, we are done. Thank you all for uh, sticking around for so long. Um, we are, I will post that snippet of code, that exact snippet of code that I used to establish the database connection. I will post that same snippet of code into um, the Slack, uh, Slack chat um, later on. And uh, tomorrow we'll pick up here. Um, we only have a, a, a couple of things to wrap up on the back end before we finish the deploy. Um, and then we have a couple uh, small things to talk about. And then um, we will jump to uh, uploading our capstones and taking instead of blog code, we'll move over to uploading our capstone, and then we'll be done. So um, again, thank you all for, for sticking around, and uh, 
Um, have a great rest of your evening, and I will see everybody tomorrow. All right, have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, see y'all. Okay. Stop.